Hello, everyone, and welcome to Point of Purchase by Geekspeak Commerce. On this show, we gather with other experts within the e-commerce domain to talk about all things retail, technology, business strategy, and more. My name is Trisha Williams, and I'm the managing partner and client success leader here at Geekspeak Commerce. And I'm going to be your host for today's episode as well. So this episode of Point of Purchase is a special one uh, because it's the first episode from our new spin-off series that we've titled Canadian Commerce, presented in partnership with our good friends at BrandSpark International. Now, at Geekspeak, we have the pleasure of working with three distinct groups. We work with brands, distributors, and retailers. We work with them to develop their e-com strategies, to build their brand presence online. We help them with advertising, operating digital storefronts, and everything in between. But to execute on all this, we need access to quality data and insights to understand what's happening in the market, what the competition is doing, consumer behavior, price optimization, product assortment and merchandising, and the list goes on. Uh, the challenge is we don't often have access to quality data and insights specifically for the Canadian market. Much of what we see is you know, US-based, and, and so a lot of inferences uh, tend to be made, right? But lucky for us, we have some friends at BrandSpark that conduct their annual e-commerce shopper study specifically focused on Canada. So we thought, you know what, let's pair our 20 years of digital experience at GeekSpeak with the consumer research experts at BrandSpark to share some meaningful data points and insights. So we'll be leveraging data from the BrandSpark 2023 e-commerce shopper study and for each episode of Canadian Commerce, um, we'll dig into a particular product category or area of focus from the study itself. So for today's episode titled Unpacking the Data on Online Grocery Sales in Canada, I'd like to invite Philip Scrutton from BrandSpark to join me. Hi, Thanks, Bill. Patricia. Hi. Thanks, for, thanks for having us. You bet. Glad to see you again. And I'm really excited to kick things off on Canadian Commerce. Me too. All right. So before we get into things, um, I do want to let the audience know that if you have any questions as Phil and I start chatting here, feel free to drop them in uh, the comments section of your, whatever platform you're watching us from, whether it's LinkedIn or YouTube. We'll pick those up near the end of the show. All right. So without any further delay, let's get into this. Are you ready to go, Phil? Absolutely. All right, super. So why don't you share a bit about your backstory? Uh, what's your background and what's your role at BrandSpark? Sure. So yeah, so I'm Philip Scranton. I'm VP Shopper Insights at BrandSpark International. Um, I've been doing Canadian market research for about the last 15 years um, at BrandSpark. But prior to that, I studied engineering. So I come from a little bit of a different, uh, different background. So I love the data. I love getting into that, but I also love finding the story and how we can help marketers, um, what are the real insights that are going to help marketers. To go a little bit broader, um, BrandSpark is a boutique market research and consulting firm. We really specialize in both brand strategy as well as omni-channel shopper insights. So in my work at BrandSpark, a lot of my time is spent leading custom shopper and brand research, um, heavily for consumer goods and retail clients. Um, during that time, I've also been managing our syndicated consumer surveys, which we've been running for a little more than a decade. Those include the BrandSpark Canadian Shopper Study, BrandSpark American Shopper Study, um, BrandSpark Trust Study, and the one we'll be talking about today, the BrandSpark E-Commerce Shopper Study, which is, as Trisha said, focused on really Canadian attitudes and behaviors to e-commerce in Canada. Awesome. So that was a lot. It sounds like you have <laughs> a great uh, background. Um, so the last study that you mentioned is the BrandSpark E-Commerce Study. And that's where we're going to be focusing today. Um, can you tell us more about the study itself? How big is it? When is it done? And who's involved? Absolutely. So we, we started this in 2016. Um, and we were really interested to learn more about e-commerce as it was really taking off in Canada, expanding across a range of the categories. We wanted to get a deep understanding of, e of kind of how Canadians were shopping online, why they were shopping online, so that we could support our research and consulting clients. And so we launched this study. Um, and it's become an annual study each year that pulls uh, Canadians who 18 plus who essentially shop in any category online at least every three months or, or more often. Um, and it really digs into both their attitudes to the online retailers that they visit, as well as how they shop in specific key categories. Awesome. Well, we love it and it's so needed. 
Um, can you elaborate a little bit um, about the panel sources? I noticed that on the slide on screen. What does that mean? So we, we, it's really important to us that this study is a representative national sample, and we use multiple panel sources. One is our proprietary community of shoppers, the BrandSpark Shopper Panel, um, which is essentially just a broad pooling of Canadians who've opted in to participate in research with us. But we also use other third-party panels as well to ensure that everything is balanced nationally, coast to coast, um, by age, gender, province, um, as well as uh, conducting the survey in both French and English. Got it. Awesome. So that's good to know. We're coast to coast and also in French and English. That's that's great. All right. So I know at BrandSpark, you're really in tune with responding to your client base. You know, how have their needs or specific requests for data helped to shape the survey as it's evolved over the years? Well, one thing we found is it, it became it was really most important to understand kind of why consumers were shopping how, online, how to position products, the assortment of products um, in order to kind of meet that shopper mindset online, as right. well as understanding the behaviors um, so that the right tactics could be leveraged, the right initiatives um, would be invested in, like among the tools that the online retailers are making, making available. So we really dug heavily into uh, a research design that had shoppers telling us about mm -hmm. real shopping occasions that they'd made online and sort of what motivated it. Right. Um, what did they do on those occasions and kind of what was the ultimate outcome of engaging with the e-retailer on, on that occasion? Got it. Okay. Well, let's dig in a little bit. Uh, let's start by looking at general online growth and penetration. How often are consumers shopping online and how does this compare to the same time last year? Um, well, top level overall for the last few years, e-commerce is really firmly established as part of Canadians' shopping routine. So the old concerns that we saw, and we even still saw it when we started the study in 2016, there were still some concerns about online payment or just where do I shop? What's available? Is shipping going to be reliable? Even with big retailers like Amazon, those have really faded away. So consumers know that online shopping is something that they can do in many categories. Um, it can be part of their consideration set. And right now, over three and four Canadian shoppers really are shopping online at least every month. Um, and half of those do so every every week. So, the, so most of us are kind of jumping online. We know we know we can do that. This uh, reliance on online retail in 2023 is comparable to last year, um, but it is lower than what we saw in the pandemic peak. So we mostly see that in a decline in those making purchases every week. So that really heavy, heavy online ordering has declined a little bit um, and shifted to, to lower frequency. And this is really largely due to a rebalancing versus in-store retail. And of course, that was a bit of, there was a barrier against those in-store trips during the pandemic. Um, but what we do see is we still see underlying growth with growth right. seen in different categories continuing. Absolutely. So you mentioned three and four Canadian shoppers shop at least once a month. So that means 75% of shoppers are making at least one purchase online each month, right? That's yeah, yeah. really interesting to me because, uh, you know, being in this space for so long, it's just phenomenal to see how attitudes towards e-commerce have truly changed over the years. Yeah, it's become so important um, just for consumers to know where to find things online and just to mm -hmm. build up that experience in time. It's, it's so important to know where to shop in a given category online and how to navigate that retailer for that retailer to be easy to navigate in order um, for online just to be a top of mind and kind of low effort ways to shop. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we've all gotten over that the scary part of this unknown, is it safe? Can sites be trusted and so forth? So many of us have tried it. We see that it works. It's easy. It's convenient. It's now just a part of how we shop. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So according to the study, all categories saw growth over the last year. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, so this was uh, almost a little bit surprising. So the growth that we saw across all of the categories we track, and this was a list, a rather detailed list of 25 or 26 categories, and we saw penetration growth in each category. So essentially we saw a larger number of Canadians having made orders in those categories in the prior three months uh, to, the, to when we ran the survey this June and July. So we were a little bit surprised because we know some of those categories, the actual sales volumes, have pretend, some of them had declined, um, some, some not. 
But to see the growth in every category was interesting. And it, and it really reinforced that we're still seeing new consumers moving into categories online. Even during the pandemic, we still had many, many shoppers within categories who were who were not making online orders. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's still a lot of room for this kind of fundamental growth of and, and acquiring new shoppers and making them comfortable with the platform that was kind of the strategy pre-COVID. It was definitely an accelerated urgency during COVID, but there's still a need for that. We're not just we're not just at a stage where it's plateauing and we need to focus on kind of frequency and basket growth, although those are important because the reason we may not be seeing um, volume growth or kind of dollar growth in all these categories, despite the penetration growth, is that frequency is is often down for the existing shoppers in the category. Yeah, this is really interesting as well. So um, post pandemic, we've seen about 4% more households households order groceries online, despite the fact that most consumers, as you mentioned, have returned to brick and mortar stores. Can you dig into that a little bit more as well? Because in my world, there's always this conversation about, you know, consumer behavior pre-pandemic, during the pandemic and post-pandemic. Yeah, this one was actually a little surprising to me because, I mean, the motivations to try online grocery um, during the pandemic were, of course, really strong. Like you couldn't really create a scenario that would like prompt more people to try to try the online channel in these categories than that. Um, but there's still people who, who did it. I mean, there's still a cost to it. And everyone, um, while the pandemic kind of put us all in the same boat, in many senses, different shoppers were always at different life stages. So there could be delivery costs associated. It's where you live. It's your family structure. There's a lot of reasons why people still may not have, have kind of dabbled in online grocery during the pandemic, but have now kind of done so in the past year for the first time. Uh, and then we see that with kind of 4% more households having made an order in the prior year and uh, kind of half of those in the in three months, uh, spring, kind of spring 2023. Absolutely. And I think the industry is pretty dynamic as well. There's a lot of things that are changing and improving and evol evolving, like, you know, the, the idea of a flat fee uh, to be paid annually for um, click and collect or even delivery has been introduced into the market, which didn't exist before. So a lot of those things may be driving this number as well. Yeah, just generally in research, when we see something that seems to kind of go against the expectation, just based on macro trends or demographics, um, kind of smart initiatives from the retailers or marketers are usually right. the explanation. There you go. OK, so let's talk about price. Um, it's, you know, inflation and pricing. It's in the news all the time. <laughs> So yeah. when it comes to price, what are shoppers expecting online and how can brands and retailers react? Yeah, so this is an important part of what, when, how consumers make their channel decisions. It's not the number one reason why they choose to shop online anymore, but it's an important part of it. Um, and when consumers are shopping online, they, they generally expect at least price parity, but they are much more likely to expect a lower price to be kind of findable online than in store, um, rather than anticipating that they would have to pay a higher price for the convenience of online fulfillment. Um, and that's particularly true for Amazon. So Amazon shoppers um, are kind of split between expecting price parity with the discount retailer or another price competitive retailer they shop in store um, or an even lower price. Um, and it's, of course, it's a big driver to the channel. Um, and it's something that I think helped, um, helped continue to support e-commerce, particularly support Amazon um, post pandemic as we came into a higher inflationary uh, period. Right. Got it. So if we focus on that first bar there on the graph on screen, which is just the grocery category, we're seeing 65% of respondents um, expect the same pricing in store as well as online from omni-channel retailers like Walmart and Loblaw, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it makes a sense of there's a few there are a few things we can unpack there. So a lot of them are shopping similar banners that they would shop in store. Right. And in that case, price parity is, is primarily what they would expect. In grocery, more than any of the other categories, we see a percentage expecting that they are going to pay a little more. Um, and there's two things driving that. So it's only 15 percent, but it's, it's interesting. No, it's higher than any of the other categories. And what's driving that is there is a segment that's willing to pay a premium for a better fulfillment service. And if that could mean the third party like Instacart, but it could also mean simply ordering from a conventional 
omnichannel grocer that offers a higher service than maybe the discount or another banner that they regularly shop when they shop in store. Right. Got it. And so the 20% expect lower prices online versus in store. So to me, that means that 85% of the folks surveyed perceive yeah. that online pricing um, is the same or less than in store, despite inflation. Yeah. So there's two there's two reasons why why we see that percent think they're going to find lower prices when we dig into their behavior. Right. One is some shoppers who've kind of got good at navigating the online system find it e actually easier to find to identify certain discounts when shopping online. Um, the, they're starting now to leverage things like the sales section in addition to the print flyers or digital flyers that they would look at when they shop in store. Um, they can filter for items that are on sale. They can find the, those kind of ways to save. Um, there's new tools to find those ways to save, but it's also people shifting banners. So there are, uh, as much as omnichannel loyalty is significant, there are people shopping at different banners. So what someone making a Walmart grocery order um, isn't for certain a Walmart in-store shopper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting I mean, because the average shopper now has greater reach, right? They can access... Um, better deals, promotions, um, lower prices um, versus driving around to individuals. Yeah, yeah. so in, in store, people wanted price, like prices for the products that they wanted that were competitive, that they thought were that they thought were good prices. That was the number one driver. And then the second was proximity. You weren't really gonna drive across town to save a few dollars. Exactly. Um, maybe when you're stocking up at Costco, but generally no, proximity was always the number two, if not number one driver. And, online really ships that if it's going to be delivered proximity is not such an issue it's more now it's delivery time and, and urgency absolutely and i think you know shoppers have gotten more savvy to your point they know how to find those promotions or fly digital flyers and um the retailers have gotten more savvy as well offering them yeah <laughs> so, okay so my next question is really important um to the brands that we work with um where are consumers shopping the most for their groceries online and how has this changed over the past year? Um, so it's been quite stable, but I'll, uh, in the past year. But I'll break I'll break it down a little bit. So people shopping for kind of groceries and packaged food. When they shop online, there's there's a tendency of some shoppers to segment out some of their packaged food that they can order from retailers like Amazon, um, which for the grocers is a bit of Amazon becomes a threat to some of those center of store shelf stable sales. And Amazon is the individual banner that has the greatest reach. So one and two, um, online buyers of, of food and beverage or, or fresh or frozen grocery products are ordering packaged food items from Amazon. Um, overall, omnichannel grocers, their reach with those buying any sort of food and beverage online is about three and four shoppers. Um, but individually, and you can kind of see it, see on the chart there, um, no single banner is, of course, as big, as big as Amazon. But really, those are the twin pillars of kind of where where they're ordering from. Right. You know, just a few short years ago, purchasing grocery items uh, from Amazon in particular was a pretty novel mm -hmm. idea, especially for Canadians. Um, and we were so apprehensive about uh, making those types of transactions. So it's pretty incredible to see how much the grocery category has grown. Uh, despite it being limited to shelf uh, stable products on Amazon. Uh, but the, the importance of that platform is, is undeniable. There's no question. Yeah, the, uh, the, there are, of course, key differences how they, how they use the platform. So Amazon orders will often be more frequent, um, but limited to more particular categories that they've kind of got locked into the Amazon routine with. Mm -hmm. um, basket growth can be, can be a, a challenge for Amazon breaking through new categories. But as a kind of fulfillment system and as a trusted way to purchase products, both in terms of price and the fulfillment, um, it's, a, it's still a formidable competitor in, in, in packaged food as well as other categories. Absolutely. So let's move on to brand loyalty. Um, how are consumers choosing which brands to purchase from online versus brick and, the brick and mortar store? Um, so... There's a couple of things. So the, there is a tendency to shop retailers that they may already be familiar with in store. And a big part of that is it makes it just easier to shop, easier to order. And a, and a major reason why they want to shop online, why they ship certain occasions online is for the convenience and it's to save time. And so shopping a new retailer for the first time online, um, you have to figure out how to navigate it, how to find those items. The assortment may be different. So you need to find alternatives. 
So there's a hump anytime you want to shop a different different retailer for the first time. Um, so overall, um, most shoppers are shopping similar stores that they would shop, uh, are shopping online similar stores that they would shop uh, in, in person. Um, and part of the reason is, is it helps when retailers can make that experience even easier. So one thing that they can do is when the purchase histories are connected. So right now we see that about one in two uh, grocery purchase occasions, shoppers are reloading several of those items from their purchase history to help them build their basket. And so also repeating with the same retailer um, makes that key online benefit of convenience um, even greater. Yeah, I'd say your survey results definitely validate my behavior as well as a shopper. Um, I definitely agree that convenience and trust are really important. You know, I kind of consider myself a bit of a power online shopper. And, and so I don't want to enter my credit card info on too many sites. And, and that order history, as you called out, is incredibly uh, powerful because it saves so much time. And it already contains, you know, the brands that, that I like. So I can definitely see how that plays out. Yeah, and one other thing that I think is really remarkable is you'll see that not a lot of significant changes are highlighted on, on the chart you were just showing. And so really, the there's a lot of stability, um, 2022 right. till 2023, and where these shoppers were shopping online. So they need a compelling reason to, to switch retailers once they're familiar with one. Um, and they obviously initially are also attracted to one um, that offers a certain kind of like price versus assortment that, that fits them as a shopper and their needs generally. Right. So how do shoppers actually go about choosing where where they will go to shop? Um, in terms of the channel, um, there's a we can break out consumers a different way. So there's about a third of online grocery shoppers who really are making a really high percentage of their online orders, of their grocery orders online or grocery purchases online. Um, they love the convenience. They generally don't really like the store. So it's becoming not entirely a, a default, but when they have the time and when it's when the basket's sufficient enough that it's worth putting together an order, um, it's almost like their default. But about half of those making kind of semi-frequent online grocery orders are just doing so fairly infrequently. It's probably accounting for less than 25% of the groceries they buy. And they're looking and they're doing it when there's particular uh, particular need to save time. They're too busy. Their kind of food at home is kind of getting understocked, but they're at, they feel too busy or overwhelmed to make that trip to the store. Um, and then the convenience of online fulfillment becomes that much more valuable for them in those moments. Right. I think, you know, consumers today don't just choose one channel and stick to it 100%, as you called out. We, you know, we shop and using different channels at different times, just depending on a number of different factors, right? Yeah, yeah. And we can see, uh, uh, you can see on the slide here, um, a little representation of that segment. There is a segment that just doesn't like going to the store right. um, and never did. It's it's online uh, has a big advantage in capturing those people, of course. They just don't like the experience. It's not enjoyable. This segment's actually the minority, though. So it's, it's also worth remembering on the inverse of that, that the majority uh, of Canadians think it is kind of enjoyable to do the grocery trip during COVID. That wasn't necessarily the case, but now that people are, things are open again, people find it somewhat enjoyable. It's a bit of a, like a light mental stimulation. It's a bit of an escape yeah. from others, other sometimes more pressing or stressful responsibilities, uh, but still feels like productive time. And, uh, and that actually resonates with a lot, with a lot of consumers. One other thing that drives people, of course, to potentially shop online when they might have shopped in store is uh, they're aware of specific online promotions. That could be because they're shopping an online only retailer like Amazon, so it's a big part of it. Um, but it could also be that online is opening up to a retailer that they wouldn't have shopped in store, um, but they can access the promotions that way. So maybe Walmart sales are just really compelling that week. They don't love making a little bit further drive to the Walmart Superstore. They can make that order uh, online. Absolutely. So I guess different strokes for different folks. It just depends yeah. on preferences as well, right? All right. So what about when a shopper does not buy? Um, what are some of the reasons? What can brands and retailers do to address these barriers? Yeah. So, so when retailers, when consumers kind of approach a retailer, there's generally some familiarity, some trust in the retailer. So the big question when they walk away, the issue is usually at the product level. They're walking away from a product and why are they doing that? Um, and so we asked them about it. We thought maybe it would be the price isn't competitive or the delivery time wasn't right. But a lot of those are actually taken care of with 
the retailer selection. They're choosing a retailer that's price competitive. They're choosing a retailer that has fulfillment, that's timely and that they trust. And so what actually came up most as a barrier to converting on a product purchase was the information. They, they just wanted more information on the product. Um, it started with kind of clear and complete information in terms of identifying that it is the exact variant, the exact size and format that they would purchase in store, that that size and format compares to the price context. Um, but they actually go, go deeper than that. And, it's, and part of it is getting this wealth of information online still to make up for the kind of intangibility um, of an image versus a product on shelf. They become a lot hungrier for, for information. Um, and that consider it, so, so really providing as much of that information as is, as is potentially relevant, more images than, than just kind of the front and back of pack. Um, it's really welcome to shoppers considering a product and it helps, con right. helps conversion. Um, and then the other part that's really unique online that's helping um, drive consideration is the consumer endorsement. So the consumer reviews, which everyone's kind of learned, learned to rely on online that are typically so strong on Amazon and uh, may or may not be strong on, on other retail sites are really helpful to drive that as well. Absolutely. Well, all of that is music to my ears because that's where uh, we spend most of our time at GeekSpeak, you know, collecting product information, normalizing it, creating rich content that offers shoppers with the information that they need to make those purchasing decisions we were talking about. Um, and it's actually funny because in the early days of e-commerce, we used to say, uh, you know, we try to get as close as possible to replicating that in-store experience online. But nowadays, it's not uncommon to find shoppers in store with their phone in hand, looking up product information and ratings and reviews that you simply just don't get from looking at a package in store. Are you? Yeah, it, it's really interesting because there's there's certain types of products that are they're low risk, they're like low investment, yep. they're low risk. When you're shopping in the grocery stores, um, if it's a there's particular categories where maybe you personally feel like the stakes are higher and you will do research through your phone in store, but it's, it's rare, but online, it becomes another issue to just ignore, ignore that data. It's there in front of you. Um, and it almost seems foolish. Consumers kind of tell us it almost seems like foolish to just ignore that. So they will consider the number of reviews, but then it takes them down a path. So they'll start seeing like a lot of leading products will have a similar number of reviews, a similar kind of average star rating. And then, so then it compels them to go the next step and they start reading the more detailed uh, individual reviews. Um, and similarly with the product information, as they go down the path of trying to compare, con consider the way, consider the format, confirm those details, it takes them down that path of reading into that richer content, into the manufacturer's product description, potentially into extended kind of brand content below that. Got it. So according to the study, um, shoppers are more inclined to enjoy shopping in store this year compared to last year. Um, can you speak to the importance of a great omni-channel experience? Yeah, so I think what's really, one thing that's really important is, is well, first to remember that the large majority are going to shop in both channels. You're not gonna convert someone to be an online only shopper. They're gonna be an omni-channel shopper. Um, and ideally for a retailer, they're going to shop your banner as well when they need to shop online, that you're not losing those occasions uh, to someone else who provides that that service better. Um, and there is an advantage with the greater channel experience of keeping them because if you can connect their purchase histories, if you can connect them through loyalty points or other information about them, um, they take advantage of the fact that they understand your assortment and make and just make sure it's as easy as it can be that that familiarity they have with you in store carries forward to making the online shopping experience easier, um, you have a better chance of retaining them and kind of keep it keeping those sales. And then for the brands as well, you got to realize these, these shoppers are going to, uh, they're going to see your brand in both channels. So the story needs to be consistent. Um, but also, even if they're only making 10% of their purchases in your category online, it's still enough occasions that they're going to see some of your brand content, your reviews, they're going to see your competitors content and uh, consumer reviews for your competitors. Um, and so it's still part of the total information that they're getting, even, even if 90% of the purchases are ultimately being made in store. I love that you just uh, brought up the consistency in the brand experience, because that's something that we tackle all the time as well. You know, brands spend a lot um, offline um, in 
establishing their brand presence and um, the look of the products, the innovation, all that good stuff. But when it comes to that moment of truth, when the product is actually listed on a retailer site, all of that uh, imagery and all of the storytelling sort of falls away. And that's something that we really try to preach uh, at GeekSpeak is making sure that you have that you know, consistent branding and storytelling all the way through to that moment of truth when you're about to hit add to cart or thinking yeah. about it. And, and, and so much of in-store shopping is is visual. You want them to yeah. to recognize what they've seen when they shopped online as well. It'll, it'll help you stand out in-store as much as it helps you convert online. Absolutely. So let's dig into the content on the product display page a little bit more. Um, what type of content are shoppers noticing the most or finding the most important? Yeah, so there's kind of two reasons why a shopper clicks through to the product page. Um, they'll do it even for regular products that they've already purchased before because they want to confirm absolutely that this is the same product that they want. And so they'll look at that front of the product image, make sure it's ringing a bell, that this is the thing they're supposed to buy, either because they bought it themselves, but maybe they're buying it for someone else and their memory isn't as perfect about the name. They need the visual reminder. So essentially, no surprise, that's essential. And that's what they're most likely to look at. But then they go down the list and we see that they are trying to, comp they are checking the product weight, they're checking the product details and specs. They want to confirm that it is, it is what they're supposed to be buying. Um, but then we have shoppers that are considering product for the first time and they start to go a little bit uh, deeper. And so we start um, roughly, it'll be about kind of 15% of the time that a shopper tells us they're buying something that is entirely new to them. Uh, one of the products in their basket they've never bought before. So it's a kind of a limited opportunity that you want to make the most of. And on those occasions, that's when they're more likely now to check their retailer product description, um, dig into the reviews. Um, and if it's present, uh, potentially that extra content from the brand. For sure. This is another important one for us at uh, GeekSpeak because we often get asked, you know, um, about whether or not the investment in content is truly worth it. Uh, but based on these survey results alone, I definitely say that it is. Um, there are a number of other factors for sure. But making sure that consumers are able to make those informed purchasing decisions with confidence is always our goal. Um, and we want to make sure shoppers know, as you called out, the size of the product, the format, the flavor, because when there's doubt, you know, shoppers hesitate to add to cart. Um, yeah, the other and, and, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then, and on that, the numbers to focus on here, because we've got these kind of three sets of numbers is really the, the numbers above the green arrows in the middle. So that's the conversion. So that's the percent of people who notice that content on that occasion who identified it as being among the most influential content uh, toward their purchase. And so, well, a kind of enhanced or richer brand content isn't always present. For those that uh, that recalled it, um, the, converge, the impact on conversion was as important as the basic product information. And then when we have to consider when they're considering that content, and that's when it's uh, often kind of new to the product, Potential, potential new acquisition, new trial consumers. Absolutely, no, those are really powerful data points for sure. The other thing that you called out was just uh, the importance of promotions and, and deals and things of that nature. And you know, there's a lot of activity going on in the grocery category in Canada right now related to advertising and promotion as Walmart and LCL, the Loblaw banners have launched self-serve platforms, very similar to, to Amazon, so it's, uh, you know, a great way for brands to push brand awareness and conversion in the grocery space just by simply advertising and taking advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, I mean, and it's great that they have those and that it can be more dynamic. Sometimes the uh, consolidation in, in, in the market, of course, gives retailers a lot of power, but it's also great that we have these kind of um, kind of three really major players, but I mean, the ones after that with like Metro and Sobe Zinc are also kind of considerable, but we have these major players that we can, we can work through and really make sure we understand well. Absolutely. So uh, we're getting close to the end here, Phil, already. Um, if you could pull out one main takeaway uh, for our audience um, out of this year's e-commerce shopper study, what would it be? I think the thing that jumped out the most for me, and especially given that kind of the early history of e-commerce was really price driven, is that even now kind of post-pandemic where we're comfortable with in-store shopping, 
and in the face of major grocery inflation in the past year, the core driver to shop online is still convenience. So it's still really about making the online experience as kind of seamless um, as possible, both at the retailer level and then also providing all that information at the product level and the brand level that people can can make their decisions easily. Um, that's really kind of just going with the flow of why they're there. They want to save time. They want to buy things because that's, I mean, that's the purpose of engaging. They want to fulfill those consumer needs and that's why they're there. Um, and um, they didn't drastically change their price hunting behavior in light of inflation. I mean, essentially these categories, these products, all retailers were in kind of in the same boat when it came to, when it came to that. So the channel choice, the retailer choice still really, really driven by factors of convenience. Absolutely. And I definitely agree, you know, e is not going away anytime soon. We've certainly seen that from the survey results. Um, and it's continued to invest in it. Um, the big players like Amazon, Walmart, LCL, voila, uh, they're certainly continuing to do so. All right, I'm just gonna check to see if we have any questions from the audience here. And it looks like we do have one. Um, so Phil, how can retailers ensure that their in-store promotions and activations translate into the online space? I mean, I think the best thing is you want to make sure they're noticed. So people have a habit of they can identify those tags at shelf for promotion. Um, they are still leaning on things like the flyer and the digital flyer. In order to make sure that you get that same kind of reach and conversion among the online shoppers, you got to leverage all of the Make sure the data is connecting to all of those tools that that online retailer might provide. Make sure that's going to be featured in the sales section um, and not only the digital flyer that's carrying into the sales section. If the retailer is offering filtering for sales or recent current promotions, make sure that that's that that's working, that that's going to be in place, um, and just that all these other ways of finding and finding a deal online are going to work for you. The one other way, and you always got to test test whether you're getting the right conversion and ROI, but consumers really are. Um, they welcome actually the advertising that they see on omnichannel grocery sites. Um, and as a product of the fact that it is fairly well targeted and it usually is uh, kind of concurrent with a promotion. Um, but because of that, the, the shoppers really do report that the that kind of advertising and some of those suggestions to purchase that are sponsored are valuable to them. Absolutely. And I think those are the types of ads that consumers actually go looking for. <laughs> they go hunting for those yeah. ads. To the ones that tell you you're going to save money right right now, right? It's urgency exactly. and it's value. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So to wrap things up, uh, we do like to end our shows on a bit of a fun question here. Uh, so when you're shopping online for groceries, uh, Phil, what's that one item that you always put in your basket? Okay. Well, I think this is probably pretty com pretty common one. Um, but outside of getting the milk, milk and eggs and bananas, it's got to be coffee. So I hate opening the, the coffee pantry and finding I'm out of coffee or that coffee bag doesn't have enough, enough beans in it. So I'm always uh, stocking up. When it's time to order that online, which is where I order it, it's, it's always a stock up. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. I am the same way. I found my preferred coffee brand on a particular platform and I keep reordering from there and they just happen to be out of stock right now. So I was stuck having to find a substitution. Yeah. So a retailer opportunity yeah. for another retailer when you have there to you do go. that out of stock hunt. But Exactly. Yeah. And that I did. All right. So thank you so much for a great show. I think we kick things off uh, pretty well with Canadian commerce. Um, and I know that we shared a lot of great information with our audience and Hopefully it's food for thought. And uh, that pun was absolutely intended. <laughs> um, and I think it'll be really important as a lot of brands and retailers navigate this budget season. Um, so folk, if folks want to learn more about uh, the e-commerce shopper survey or Brandsmark, where can they find you, Phil? Um, so they can reach out to me at the uh, email there. So it's pscredden at brandspark.com. If you find you lost that, you can come through our website and go to the uh, contact us. But uh, that's the most direct way to get, to, to get a hold of me. And the study is available. Uh, I'm always happy to engage in conversation, but the full study is also available to purchase. And that includes detailed data tables, um, a grocery food and beverage deep dive report, as well as a multi-category report that covers kind of all of the categories that you see listed there. 
Awesome. And we'll continue to break down the study as well over the next, uh, over the coming months. Um, so you can stay tuned for that. Uh, so if you need support in growing your online business, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or check us out on uh, geekspeakcommerce.com. Thank you all so very much, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day, everybody.